this movie was definitely crafted to be rewatched. And so like, I got to give it lots of props for that because that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. And to think about, I want to make a movie that once you know the reveal, you're going to want to race back and watch this movie over again. And it's going to deliver that everything that happens is at least somewhat understandable based off the explanation we've been given. It ups the magnitude of difficulty. The narrative has to make sense and you need to have not have continuity errors and all these things. But then you're upping the ante by being like, all right, but we're also going to layer it and layer it and layer it to the point that that and that's that attention to detail that I, I talk about all the time on here. Like directors, that that is your job is to do as much pre-production as possible to craft something that is so rich like this. Welcome, friends, to episode 251 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm filmmaker James Bailey. And I'm writer Luke Elliott. And this week we discuss David Fincher's 1999 film, Fight Club. Revisiting this movie was a trip. There were a lot of things that I remembered, obviously, and were sort of back in my memory from covering the book. But it's been a while since I've seen this. And man, I just I think about how much this film meant and means to me. Like I, I just it hit at a time where I was like, starting to really get into filmmaking. And I remember like, I don't know what edition of the DVD that had come out, but they had the commentary track. And I remember listening to the commentary. Yeah. On this. I've also listened to the commentary track on this. I remember doing that. It's really good because it's got all the main cast and Fincher. It's it's awesome. You no, know, you're totally right. Like that nostalgia, you know, and like, I think it's also just like an awareness of what movies can do. Like this felt like it was pushing envelopes. It was fun. Um, I don't think we gave the book enough credit for how funny it actually is, but this movie is hilarious in a lot of ways. Like it's a real like black comedy, but it it is truly funny. It pushes boundaries. It's super meta, and I think that meta nature of it works even better in the film um, because you can play with like the idea that you are watching a movie right yeah. now and it's very aware of that well and like consumerism i read somewhere that that supposedly according to fincher he told empire magazine I, he said in every frame of the movie you can see a starbucks cup okay i'm sure that's not true but <laughs> I, it can't be true but but the, i think the point being that it's there's a lot of them and and then that that idea of like the subliminal i mean in films we, we it happens all the time with product placement it's a, a thing that yeah has pervaded the industry forever i have a feeling they didn't get sponsored by starbucks though <laughs> For this one, <laughs> I think Star. I think Starbucks was okay with them using really because Starbucks takes takes some some damage in this one. <laughs> well, and so there's a moment where you know the ball gets rolling per se, and yeah. and like a coffee shop takes a hit, and it was originally going to be a Starbucks, and they did not okay that part. They were okay with the cups, but not okay with the interesting coffee okay. shop. Because I think it was quite clear that it was a Starbucks, but I guess it wasn't named. They changed directly. the name. They, I think they just called it a franchise coffee shop or something yeah and i want to touch on something just right out of the gates that that you alluded to as well but i think it holds very true to me this movie and fight club in general i don't think last week um i fully conveyed how influential it was on me not just as a as a creator and as a writer but as a person um this hit me at a time where i was trying to figure out the world and I was frustrated with a lot of, like, the consumerism, the the bullshit that was going on, right? And this comes in, and it speaks to that. And it, it does it in a way that is very, like, we're just going to kind of talk about how everything's terrible. And um, not necessarily, we're not, it's not necessarily concerned with, like, providing realistic alternatives. But it's more about just, like, destroying the status quo and attacking the status quo. And I think there is, like, a real value to that. And I don't want to, like, take away from that as I'm talking about all the ways in which I think it does, you know, not hold up or it didn't end up landing with me as an, like, older adult now. Um, But, like, I still want to, like, give all the credit to that and, like, how my thoughts as a young man about the material here led me in in a large way to become the person I am today. Like, thinking about these ideas, thinking about consumerism being dissatisfied with 
these markings of success and how they do feel empty and how, you know, the you are not your job, you are not your car, like all that stuff. I internalized that in a lot of ways growing up. And as much as I am going to be critical at times, um, I want to start off with acknowledging that of all the projects we've covered on this podcast, this is one of the most influential. I don't, I don't, I'd have to really think about it, but like it's up there. Probably top five for sure as far as like most influential on you know, Luke Elliott as a person, Fight Club is right there. Well, and I think that's important to note too. Like this is this is movie is always going to speak really precisely to teenage and young white men, um, and we are were that at exactly. times. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, we still are. Well, I guess we're not young anymore. <laughs> Relatively, it's all relative. We got called a child or children recently on our YouTube video, so some people think we're young. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. No. <laughs> all right. Fine. The, yeah. <laughs> The other thing, too, though, is like it spoke to my teenage angst, right? Like you said, I didn't know where to place any of that. I just felt those emotions. And this gives you the context that I don't know that you really understand as at least I didn't as a teenager. Sort of a lot of these systems that were working against you and the the things, the decks already being stacked against you and the maybe the previous generation, you know, they talk about the wars and the, the depressions and this and that and and how, like, I mean, ultimately, you can look at the, the state of the economy and stuff today and see that the deck has been stacked against our generation and younger generations and in ways that aren't fair. And, and you know, lashing out like this was just kind of maybe not productive, but it was something that I think people feel, you know. Yeah. This movie has a real Internet forum kind of humor to it, too. Like it, this detached irony, this like nothing, nothing matters, nothing is very I, I, I don't know it's like nothing is cool and like nothing other than other than like Tyler Durden <laughs> and being against everything that's what's cool right I do think that that's a little dangerous too though because like I remember not caring about anything was like the coolest thing you could do and that's this kind of thing and like any if anybody questions you or criticizes you you're at this detachment and this irony about it all to where you've totally protected yourself from any criticism because like you're not serious, nobody's serious, nothing serious. And if somebody tries to come at you with some sort of serious criticism, you can just laugh at them because it's all bullshit, none of it matters. And so it protects you from anything like that. You know what I mean? Right. Like it feels like a, it feels like a 4chan, th- you know, forum come to life. But this is a funny time because it's way back before. I mean, there's still payphones in this movie. Like this is a time before 9/11, before internet was like a big thing. It was still just starting to come up and like um our culture was so different back then. Yet, you know, we talked last week about how in many ways this is prophetic. And, and I think that totally trolls, holds true with like attitudes. And maybe there's a little bit of chicken and egg here because I do think a lot of young men grew up on this movie and internalized a lot of this humor. And Chuck Palahniuk is it's interesting. Like I was talking to somebody recently. No clue that Fight Club was a book. They're like, that's just a movie. Like, what are you talking about? And it's like, no, no, there's also a book there. And it's, it's interesting because, like, I feel like Chuck Palahniuk is such a famous author, yet I have to remind myself all the time that, like, movie famous and book famous are not even close. So you can be a famous author, and the idea that that even scratches the surface of what it's like to be famous in filmmaking is just very different. And, like, the reaches of those two mediums is just so dramatically different. You're talking about a filmmaker like Fincher and and stars like Edward Norton and Brad Pitt. I should have asked more follow up questions. Like, does this person just think that Fincher like created Fight Club? Like, that's such a misplaced attribution for the ideas that are in this movie, because the ideas in this movie are from Palinuk. Absolutely. Right. Like, it's right out of the book. Now, it's I think some of the humor is definitely Fincher and like the stylized direction, obviously, is Fincher. And there's a lot of brilliance there. And. The performances are iconic. But when we're talking about like the meat of the story, that's all Palinuk. And unfortunately, like I think everyone knows this, too, and and acknowledges it is that like often there's this idea that people get caught up in other things besides the story and, and like the superficial nature of certain things. And they like I mean, I've heard stories about people not caring about scripts and, you know, putting things into production when the scripts aren't finished and all these other things. Are you talking about with this movie or just in general? No, in general. I've heard stories of that that kind of thing where, you know, that kind of the material is not being respected and things are being done for the wrong reason. And it just blows my mind that like, you know, you have to attribute it to in a lot of cases, too, we see is 
the director gets all the praise and then the screenwriter who maybe developed a lot of this what what this ultimately became doesn't get the credit they deserve so yeah i mean it's it's an unfortunate side effect of making movies i guess so what it seems like when you, what you're touching on is saying like this is a very important adaptation in that sense too because it it made some really smart changes it affected culture and yet it still has some of the hallmarks of adaptations where sometimes the author gets completely forgotten and like it's just got a little bit of everything that we talk about a lot on this podcast i think that this is an adaptation that in the most cases people know is a chuck palahniuk novel maybe i, th- I, I don't believe. know you know i, I don't, don't know. know readers maybe you could say people who are readers which a large portion of you know, at least the United States population, they don't read books, man. <laughs> so they're probably not caring whether if something's based off of a book, like it doesn't matter to them. True. So, I mean, to, to get into this a little bit, we have touched on Fincher before we covered Gone Girl, which I had a lot of fun with. We we really enjoyed that. Gillian Flynn wrote that novel, incredible yeah. novel. Rebecca Drake guest. I thought it was an excellent episode, honestly. Yeah, really good. So it's we'll touch on Fincher a little bit. I'll just state really quickly. He's an American film director. Uh, His films, mostly psychological thrillers and biographical dramas, have received 40 nominations at the Academy Awards, including three for him as Best Director, and he's the co-founder of Propaganda Films, a film and music video production company. And as we talked about back when we talked about Fincher the first time, he got to start in music videos, which I think is really cool. It's a great medium to get to be extremely creative and work with, you know, artists and music is such a powerful medium on, on its own to be able to put visuals to that is, is really fun. And then he worked on Alien 3, which we know is like this. People talk about it as like one of the best looking bad movies and how it, <laughs> it kind of spiraled out of his control because the studio took over in such an aggressive way and wouldn't let him get his cut. I need and, to rewatch that where I'm at now because I think the last time I saw it I was probably like 18 and I didn't you know I was just comparing it to the first two which are still absolute standout movies some of my favorite movies honestly Um, but yeah I'd I'd like to go into an alien 3 and kind of judge it based off of what it is I know it had early CGI that does not hold up like I've seen some of the like clips of like the aliens running around full CGI aliens and they look bad (laughs) Um, you know but that's part of the effect of that it's that weird transition period a lot of it's like 90s, early 2000s, where CGI was the hot new thing, yet it does not hold up because it looks so rudimentary compared to where we're at now. Even in this movie, we're going to touch back in on CGI because there's CGI that's used in this film. And I, I'm going to argue that it's even though maybe there are times that it doesn't look uh, up to the standard of what we expect today, it's used in a good way. It's used as a tool to achieve something you otherwise couldn't have. Fincher generally is very smart with his use of it. Um, you know, he, he does a lot of like CGI, just like mundane objects and backgrounds and things like that that are easy to miss. And I found myself noticing a lot more of it now just because I think like how I've trained my eye and like what I'm used to today. But I remember like so much of this stuff back in the day going, how did they do this? It looks so realistic. Like, how did they possibly get that shot? And it's like, oh, they got it in a computer. That's how. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would argue in this movie, the his use of CG is is capturing shots that you otherwise could not have achieved which is a huge deal to be doing at this time period you know in today's day and age you'll see cg all over the place for things that could have been done practically and he's specifically going and achieving shots that are impossible to capture practically and giving you a different perspective and it matches sort of the vibe of the film so there's a lot going into that too but back to fincher where he was at i kind of want to set this up with where he was at when he was creating this film uh so he created Alien 3, which had mixed reviews. Was that his first like major movie? That was his directorial debut. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But like I said, music videos. He had done music videos for Madonna and many other like mm-hmm. large scale artists. Uh, and then in 1995, he directed Seven with Brad Pitt Great and Morgan movie. Freeman. Incredible. Yeah. And much better received than, than Alien 3. Right. He then made The Game with Michael Douglas, which is actually a great Fincher film if you haven't seen. I don't know if I've seen that. I'd have to it's look the one it where more. he's like, um, I don't actually know if I can talk about it without spoiling it. But basically, okay. <laughs> like there is something that's going on where Michael Douglas's character can't tell if what's happening to him is reality or not. I may have I may have seen it. I don't, I'd have to look at it. After The Game in 97, he created Fight Club, which to be honest with you, yeah. wasn't huge in the box office. It became a no, cult. Yeah, I heard it was kind of a kind of a flop. And it became a cult 
classic. It, it started to build up that hype. Ironic. <laughs> yes. Um, it, I mean, it's such an influential movie in the history of things, I think, now. Um, it just goes to show how much, like, immediate box office success is not the whole story of a movie, and I wish that sometimes that would be acknowledged more in the industry. Same thing happens in books, by the way. Um, I feel like where we're at and where a lot of reader, readers are is the assumption that books exist in this sort of timeless uh, place where it doesn't really matter when you come to them. I think that's a great thing for the industry, and I think that is true. However, within the industry, a huge amount of emphasis is put on you know, the opening sales for a book and how it does right out of the gate. There's a huge amount of emphasis, you know, rightly or not, just like movies. Um, and a lot of the ongoing success of a book and how much continued marketing, whether or not it stays on shelves, will come back to how it does its opening few months. With the idea that this flopped, I also wanted to bring up, Fincher loves to have a really large hand and a large um, emphasis put in Final Cut, especially, I think, partially because of Alien 3 and how that all worked mm. out. He's kind of an auteur like that, right? Like He auteur. really is, yeah. And so he, he wants to have his hand in the marketing and everything as well for films. So after they had finished editing the film, the executives didn't know how to market this film. They, they had this satirical fight movie, like they're used to, you know, advertising this as like an action film. So that's actually what they did. I remember this. I remember this movie looking like it was a movie all about boxing. It was a boxing movie. Yeah, it's called Fight Club and they're fighting in the trailers. That is such a misleading. That's like Drive. When Drive came out, I don't know if you remember that movie, it was it yep. was it was marketed as if it was a Fast and the Furious film. And that is not what that movie is either. <laughs> it's just unfortunate too because you see like your A twenty fours now, like understanding Yes. And, and like I think all studios will probably make a move to this is like really understanding their material. They got smarter with it. They got smarter. So Which, finally Fincher uh wanted to have a unique marketing campaign that's gonna that would mirror the anti commercial and everything about the film um, but the executives at Fox refused to go in on his idea and instead they launched this uh, largely based around Brad Pitt's presence in the film and the fighting. Uh, the campaign was highly criticized as giving the impression that the film was basically just about men beating each other, each other up, completely ignoring the comic and satiric elements of the narrative and for marketing the film to the wrong audience. Fincher was particularly incensed when he saw ads for the film during WWE and UFC programming. Yeah, absolutely, man. I remember, I, I saw this movie in the theater and... I remember the attitude of the people in the audience was like they were there to watch a movie about fighting. And a lot of people did not know what to make of this thing. They, a lot of people didn't like it because that's not what they were there for. You know what I mean? Yeah. I almost feel like that is in a weird roundabout way trying to almost target this film at people who could – be confronted with new ideas like i don't know if that's painting with I a broad brush charitable <laughs> i think it was a bunch of executives who didn't know what the fuck to do with this subject matter and they were like what sells well maybe we can sell it as a fighting movie okay and like the fact that it didn't do well in the theaters i think is the evidence that that strategy didn't work because there is an audience for this book and this movie and they missed it i think is honestly what happened and then that audience found it after the fact because they didn't know well, and I, but I think my point being, it's interesting to note that some people, even to this day, see this movie and don't pick up on some of the satirical and some of the more like, um, you know, anti-commercialism yeah. and establishment like social portions of this. Yeah. They don't pick up on that. I don't know how you don't pick up on it, but maybe they just don't connect with it. I mean, I think in the same way as your American Psycho uh, audience that doesn't pick up on the, the commentary there. Oh, well, that's different. So you're saying like people who take it too seriously almost. Like, yeah, yeah, who yeah. who hero worship Tyler Durden and they fall down that. Well, that's so, separate because I think there's also people who look at this movie as like a... Because I remember reading reviews that were saying it was like a run-of-the-mill psychological fighting movie, you know, where it ends up being a, a contest between a protagonist and an antagonist in the end or something like that. Like, it's like completely missing kind of the points of it <laughs> and, and maybe that just comes down to like it's speaking to a certain generation of people or yeah. certain and, and a lot of and people just weren't ready for this they couldn't take the blue pill or red pill or whatever it was going to be that was going <laughs> to allow them to see th into the matrix to, as you make another reference to another movie that is widely misinterpreted uh <laughs> it, that definitely is the case for the matrix yeah but yeah. but my point is just that like they're they're so entrenched in all of this societal norms that they can't they can't they see something like this and they're like this is ridiculous over the top bullshit yeah 
I want to mention just how fun this movie is. I think I already touched on that a little bit, but like I put in my, so I have a Blu-ray of this and I was like, oh, okay, I could crack this thing. I haven't opened this up in a long time. Me too. I, we probably had the same experience. Probably. Put it in and it opens up and it's this never been kissed, um, like selection, like a DVD selection menu that then like has some static and then it transitions into the, uh, to his apartment and like a spinning camera looking around as the Ikea catalog populating the apartment and just like. It's just fun from the jump. It's meta from the jump. And I love that, like, everything about it was consistent outside of the trailers. You know what I mean? Like, it's funny to think about that. But, like, that's cool. I mean, it's so, it's so tongue-in-cheek. It's so funny. I think we both have history that we'll touch on, but I'd like to just jump into the plot here. The narrator, an automobile recall specialist, is unfulfilled by his job and possessions and suffers from chronic insomnia. To cure this, he attends support groups, posing as a sufferer of diseases. His bliss is disturbed when another imposter, Marla Singer, begins attending the same groups. The two agree to split which groups they attend. On a flight home from a business trip, the narrator meets soap salesman Tyler Durden. The narrator returns home to find his apartment and all his belongings have been destroyed by an explosion. Disheartened by the loss of his material goods, he calls Tyler and they meet at a bar. Tyler tells him he is trapped by consumerism. In the parking lot, he asks the narrator to hit him and they have a fist fight. They find the experience cathartic and agree to do it again. The narrator moves into Tyler's home, a large dilapidated house in an industrial area. They have further fights outside the bar which attract growing crowds of men. The fights move to the bar's basement, where the men form Fight Club, which routinely meets. This is our second Edward Norton vehicle of the last, like, I don't know, a couple months. And I thought that was kind of funny, too. Like, I was saying how I I think he's kind of an underappreciated actor. And um, this was another just moment of me realizing how, uh, you know, I talked about how influential this this movie was on me. And seeing this performance, I was like, yeah, this is like, this is really good from him. You know, this Uh, is the kind of performance that I think makes an actor. uh, It puts somebody, the actor in in the audience's good graces for basically ever, because a performance like this, knowing what's capable, what he's capable of or any actor for for that part. um, Like, I'll watch anything that Edward Norton's in for the most part, knowing that he can bring. And this might not even be his best performance, but it is the one that stands out to me. But it's very good. And and he does so much in it, right? Like he is, he's convincingly kind of just a schlummy guy who has nothing going for him. He can at times be that Tyler Durden-esque figure. He's got a little bit of that badassness to him. And then he can also just be completely unhinged running around in his underwear and like convincingly, you know, just out there. And, And beyond all of that, I feel like there's this underlying sense that he's still a good person at heart that keeps you on his side, even as you are like, you know, you should have seen a lot of this coming. You shouldn't have been as far along the trail as, as you have been, like, uh, before you realize that uh, maybe the brakes need to be put on. Um, but yet you still kind of identify with him and you can and you, you feel like he's a good guy, whether that's well, earned or not. He is centered as our protagonist right. too, and ultimately, like he pushes back against what he sees as going too far. Yep. Eventually, for himself, where his line is drawn. But I um, wish he had. He sorry, just a random aside. Just you saying that, I would have liked him to like express why it's t- going too far. I feel like he never truly gets it out. He's like, "This is too much. This is going too far." And then at one point, he's like, "We don't kill people." And then Tyler Durden says, "Well, the the buildings are all empty." And then that's it. And he's just like, oh, it's still too far. Lay out some sort of reason. I don't know. Like, I, I wanted, I just wish there was a little bit more alternative given to, to the other side of things of like why Tyler Durden isn't 100% right all the time. Let's talk about Tyler Durden because I think he's kind of the lightning rod of the film. He's like Brad Pitt. <laughs> yeah, Brad Pitt. And, and again, an, an iconic role that defined his career, I think, and kept him working for the next 20, 30 years. And, and I mean, he's incredible in basically everything. He was great in seven. Like he, yeah. he was already good and some other stuff, but this was iconic and it's him in the like height of his powers, I think. And, and playing a role that it's hard to imagine many other people being able to pull off in the way he did. He embodies Tyler Durden, right? Like he is, he is that ideal. Like he, he looks the way everybody wants to look <laughs> like, all that, I mean, that was totally true for like all the guys watching this. I think, you know, like, He's so effortlessly cool because he's not a real person. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the funny, like, uh, underside of it is, like, he's not pressure. He has no restrictions on what he can and can't do because he is a fantasy. Um, 
And and I always thought that was so funny. There's like this moment that I'll, that never really rang true for me and always was a little bit hollow where they're on the bus and they've just started Fight Club. You know, they're talking about like who they want to fight and all this stuff, right? And historical figures. And then at one point, the narrator looks over at this ad and he goes, is that what a man looks like? Uh, Tyler Durden laughs and he's like, yeah, right. You know, uh, he goes, self-improvement's masturbation. It always rang hollow to me because it's being delivered by a man <laughs> who looks exactly like the person in that ad. His abs, when they come out in like the next scene, look identical, I think, to the to the figure of the person they were laughing at on that. Like, this is not some like barrel chested, like, you know, average looking guy who's like, yeah, we, I don't want to look like a model. The guy looks like a model. Like, come on. <laughs> but he's got a grunginess to him. And, and I would I'm going to argue that this is the most iconic ab shot ever. Like, One of, like yeah, it, it might be. you see you see the shots of your Chris Hemsworth and your your superheroes these days. And like this one didn't even mean to become, I think, what it what it had become. Yeah. And it's just Brad Pitt being. And you know how much fucking guy. work he had to put into that body. So I'm it's, sure. and, and like yeah. it, there's another moment later where um, it's kind of meta. But and I think they lean into it a little bit. But like um, he's talking about how everybody was told, like sold this bill of goods. that They were going to grow up to be rock stars and movie stars and and celebrities and you know they're gonna you know look like a million bucks and all that stuff and it's being delivered by a guy who is like all of these things and he looks behind him at jared leto yeah who says rock star. at the same yeah. time was also a rock star i think and i felt like that was like a meta moment for like if you're in the know um well so from what i understand and i, I saw people referencing this in i think that he started the band and he started 30 seconds to mars in 98 i don't know that they had broken huge so it may be more of a coincidence than anything. I thought I heard that that was deliberate, but maybe maybe that's, uh, you know. It's possible that it was deliberate because he had a rock band, you know. Maybe he had a rock band and they were like, okay. let's just, you know, look at him. Anyway, I just think it's funny, like, sometimes it doesn't it doesn't ring super true to me when it's being delivered by him. As good as the performance is, if you stop for a second and, like, think about it. <laughs> like, who's telling you this stuff? <laughs> it, I agreed. But I think it rings true to me because it's someone who at least is acknowledging it, right? Like, this is someone who's thinking about these things and is delivering these lines and i mean i mean and like in the within the fantasy he is a he is a figment of edward norton's imagination and the fact of the matter is the guy who's actually delivering the lines to the characters in the scene is actually supposed to look like edward norton now edward norton i can buy it because he's kind of scrawny he's certainly not he doesn't have that like absolutely ripped appearance and shredded look that like brad pitt has so he was dropping tons of weight too because he had just done american history x oh yeah which, which he is a lot more shredded in <laughs> yeah so he's dropping a bunch of weight so that he can look like that every man kind of thing yeah and and you know if you think about those lines being delivered by him they land a little better it's funny that a film that's so about anti a lot of these things that like brad pitt being in like incredible shape is like something a lot of people walk away from this movie <laughs> talking about yeah so early on, we're talking about the first like third of the movie here. We get those flashes of Tyler Durden right out of the jump. And a lot of it is so much more obvious to me now. But like, I, mean, I don't know if there's something about like the, the our TVs we have now or like what. But like, I don't know how you could miss Tyler Durden early on popping up on the screen for a frame. Like, it's so obvious. I think it's more than a frame, too. I'd love to like pull the film into a timeline and look because a frame is very quick and you might actually miss it. But these ones, he stays on screen for a second. Yeah, you can kind of see him now. Now, the first time watching the movie, you don't know what it means. You're like, why did that just happen? It's kind of confusing. Also, imagine watching it with the imperfections of projection yeah. in a theater, right? Yeah. Like so that the, these kinds of things, like although expert projectionists are going to make it so that everything goes smoothly. But there were times that I went to movies that were projected and I I saw like you know imperfections or mm -hmm. something happened yeah it's like yeah. oh something happened in the projection well, booth if, so from the jump i want to say like the movie is brilliant in the sense that it establishes a baseline of what you are seeing may or may not be true to the story because we start with edward norton as the narrator remembering he's like having this this moment with the guns in his mouth and he's thinking about how clean it is and all this stuff and he's like where did this all begin and he starts talking about the first time he met um uh, Robert Paulson and he, then he goes actually wait it, we need to go further back but he like looks at the camera within the scene and says that and so it breaks the scene and it becomes meta and it becomes it, it shows you that like the scene you're watching probably didn't happen the way that you're seeing it 
And so that baseline makes all these little tricks that are getting played on you throughout. You don't know whether or not they're just like a fun trick that the director's doing or if it is actually a hint about something about the story. And that's why I think you miss some of this stuff the first time. Or you see it and you just don't know what it means. And you're you're more willing to just go like, oh, I thought the director was just kind of having fun with me. And then when the reveal happens that a lot of this stuff does have a reason for it and does mean something and when it happens, um, it, it makes that reveal actually land in a really cool way. Because you're like, oh, shit. Well, the reason Tyler Durden was popping up early on is because he's part of his personality. And so it makes sense that he would like all of a sudden have his arm around the guy who's like talking at the group meeting just for a flash because he is already in the mind of the narrator. I mean, it's one, it's one of those really fun things, right? It's referencing the source material where he talks about Tyler Durden splicing things into a film. And so the filmmaker in this case is splicing frames into the film to show us Tyler Durden. And it's only up until we meet Tyler Durden. So he's already existing in this film before we actually meet him. And so we're getting that subliminal feeling that Tyler Durden was trying to impress it on It gives these. him this larger than life sense too. Like he's, yeah. he's there already before we even know it. And, and so there's the flashes of him on screen. Yeah. And then there's also like he's walking around in the background of scenes yeah. sometimes. And I, I mean, there's obviously the moment in the airport where he like crosses him before he like officially meets him. Um, so there's a few of those kind of things. Yeah, man. I, so I, I was talking about how this is a black comedy. I think Edward Norton loudly asserting to Marla, I want bowel cancer <laughs> in front of that woman in the pawn shop or whatever it is. And the look on her face and then this moment where like everyone realized it was just what happened, but then they keep going. That's like one of the funniest black comedy moments I can remember. It's so funny and yet so dark. Um, and that like pitch black humor, if that appeals to you, that's one of the things that holds up super well in this movie. And I don't know that I gave Palinuk enough credit in our last episode because like a lot of these things happen in the book. But something about the performances and the the music and the setup and the and the the scene, the reactions on the faces, like makes these jokes land even better, in my opinion, in the movie. And people talk about directors like the Coens are famous for this, yeah, because they get amazing reaction shots. And reaction shots really do make movies. And people don't think about it because yeah. it's sort of an unsung hero. You want the star, you want the person who's the focal point of the scene. But when people react to it, it's a completely different animal. Like you're reacting to you're 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 getting to see how the as the audience you're getting to see how you might interact and react in the scene. And it's so powerful because we are these these like p human beings look to each other socially to see like how we react. That's why reaction shots are so powerful. We want to see how how people are reacting within the scene. It's a human uh, phenomenon is wanting to see reactions, right? And that's why reaction channels on YouTube are a big thing. Sure. There is just something appealing about seeing another human being reacting to something. It's weird and it seems so hollow, but like because I think there's like a weird. I mean, it's probably a psychologist could weigh in on this, but like. I think there is a sympathetic emotion that can happen within us. So it's like a way of feeling emotions in a certain way. Um, that's a little different here where it's more about just like how, <laughs> how like surprised the woman is. But I guess it kind of reveals to us like this is an absurd conversation. If we weren't already aware, aware of it, like having this woman over here, it is like, yeah, this, this conversation is absolutely absurd. <laughs> Because I think Marla starts off by saying, I want ascending bowel cancer. And then he cuts her off and says, no, I want bowel cancer. And it's just both of it's just crazy things to be saying. And it gets you thinking about movies too, like what conversations are had in movies with people around where like normally you're going to get reactions from people if you're saying these things or spe saying it loud enough, at least. This movie was definitely crafted to be rewatched. And so like I got to give it lots of props for that because that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. And to think about I want to make a movie that once you know the reveal, you're going to want to race back and watch this movie over again. And it's going to deliver that everything that happens is at least somewhat understandable based off the explanation we've been given. It ups the magnitude of difficulty. Like you're, you're doing something and you're making a film and the narrative has to make sense and you need to have not have continuity errors and all these things. But then you're upping the ante by being like, all right, but we're also going to layer it and layer it and layer it to the point that that and that's that attention to detail that I, I talk about all the time on here. Like uh, directors, that that is their job is to do as much pre-production as possible to craft something that is so rich like this. Um, and I think that, you know, that's that's the thing you can look at when you look at certain films today and you're like, what was what did it take to make this film? And does it fit 
what's being sold to you. Like if something's being sold to you is this really rich story and it's kind of hollow, it's probably because the the what's being baked into the tapestry of the film isn't that uh, the difficulty sort of wasn't taken on by the filmmakers. Another one that comes to mind is The Sixth Sense for me, where like you watch that movie again once you know the twist and it's a, it feels like a different movie almost, but it holds up. Um, and, and it's, it's cool to see that pulled off. It's like a magic trick that you weren't even aware, right, was happening. And then you go back and watch it and you can like appreciate the magic trick that was being done, that was being performed on you. A couple of great things, the, the midair collision where, where Edward Norton just like, I'm gonna call him Edward Norton, even though he's the narrator, just cause I think it's like a little easier. He says like, ah, oh, I prayed for a midair collision. And as he's saying those words, we see a plane come through the window, hit the, hit the other plane and we get a scene that, like, I know a lot of it's, like, CGI and stuff, but that's another moment where I thought, I thought it looked great. Like, that still holds up. And a startling moment. And it also plays into that black comedy. And, like, the look on Edward Norton's face is, like, reacting to the air pressure and everything happening around him in this fantasy. Yet he still has this look on his face of, like, I want this to be happening. It's such an interesting moment. Um you know, and this is right before I think we actually get Tyler Durden introduced uh, shortly after this. And um, it's, it's it's just all so cleverly done. Like the the this is a movie where like every moment, every frame, every scene is consistent in a certain mood, in a certain message. And, uh, you know, I, props to, to Fincher for being able to pull that off. So we've built up to this fight club scene and everything. And the way that th- I would argue the most iconic part of this film is the fight in front of the bar, their first fight. And the way that it's framed symmetrically and they're on either side and uh, just their back and forth and the performances that are put on. And you can tell the ad living. So many iconic moments. Yeah, you can tell the ad living that's going on that I read about is like they they ran the scene so many times. Uh, and that's another thing to note is I, I read that Fincher, like in terms of film reels that they shot, they shot three times the usual amount for a 120 minute film. They shot 1500 reels of film. Um, so just the, the how much he's shooting and how meticulous he's being like, that's grueling for a crew. But like, clearly you see the other the other side of it and you see what they get here. Um, and then a, a hugely uh, iconic p- part is that Fincher told Edward Norton to actually hit Brad Pitt. Uh, in the scene and the, in the neck when he hits him like in the ear uh-huh. or the neck or whatever that was like a actually hit him moment and like people talk about that that's sort of the trivia thing and did brad pitt not know he was going to actually be hit he didn't know he was going to get hit i think he said he, uh, he might have known he was going to get hit but not hard and he really hit him and they were kind of i think you can tell from the performances and and yeah they were really into them and fincher were really into like the, the whole vibe of this film yeah. and I read that like the Volkswagen Beetle was an, was something that Brad Pitt and Edward Norton really wanted to add into the film because they were really against the the new design of the bug, and it specifically had to do with the boomers sort of selling their youth to like the new youth culture and how that felt like disingenuine and that's not theirs, and and so they made the the mo- moment really big where they both look at each other when they're about to smash the headlights out of a Volkswagen Beetle, yeah. and I'm just thinking about so in that fight like. The all of a sudden the 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 cut to this close up of Brad Pitt, where he says, "I want you to hit me as hard as you can." Like that is what it's like up there in like modern movies is like one of the most iconic moments, right? Like if you're gonna if you're gonna take a moment from Fight Club, like that's one of them, right? Like that's one of the ones you I would chose. say. I would argue there's one other moment, and it's the moment where he's in the bottom of the basement and he says rule number one of oh, fight sure. club is yeah, you don't yeah. talk about fight club. Yeah. But besides that, this is the number two moment in my opinion. Like you said, yeah. I actually like what precedes that too, where he's like, uh, this is Tyler Durden to a T um, where he's like, Oh, we've had three pictures of beer and you still can't ask. Just ask me, man. And he's in like, he's dancing around it. And he's like, you know, he won't take this like evasive bullshit. He's like, no, you need to ask me. And then he finally asked him. He's like, yeah, sure. And like, just like that is so winning. It's so like such a great character moment for Tyler Durden as we get a sense of like who this guy is, at least somewhat. Um, uh, and then it leading to this fight. Um, it is almost a romance in a way. And I was thinking about how like, again, I think last last week we talked about how um, Chuck Palahniuk is gay. Um, I read that he came out like later um because i think his partner came out and so then he felt like it was going to become revealed so then he came out i was reading some about it i forget what year but it was i think it was after the publication of fight club um not sure where it lines up with this movie i think this is a romance 
in a way between Tyler Durden and our narrator. And I don't think most people watch it that way. And it's not obviously so, but you can kind of take this as the moment that Tyler Durden and Edward Norton fall in love, right? And the narrator fall in love. It's it's here. I agree. I mean, I think it's definitely there. Within the text, it's not a romantic love. It is, but it could be a a, um, a friendship, right? And a, a, a love between friends. All relationships in this film are all pretty toxic also, too. Just the way that all these relationships go together. It doesn't necessarily have to be romantic to be as intimate of a, of a relationship as they have, you know? It's a different kind of intimacy, obviously. Right. But, but I mean, and throughout, I, I was kind of struck again by how often the narrator is clearly jealous of other characters, not just Marla, but like the, the I wanted to destroy something beautiful moment with uh, with um, Jared Leto. That's clearly a, um, an act of jealousy coming from him. Agreed. Yeah. It's interesting how that I think often does get overlooked by, I don't know, certain people who watch this movie, at least. Uh, there's the sequence where his his entire apartment blows up. That's all CG. Um, and you know this is early, Looks good. fairly early for CG. Yeah, it is. It does look good, and and you can tell that it, there's some things being done that were extremely painstaking because CG, like in the way that they had used to have to, and the buildings falling at the end of the film. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> they they were created by individual artists had to spend so much time on these scenes, and the amount of time it took to render some of these things it took days to render, and they were having to then print it and like on film and and reinterpret things. And I mean, it's 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 pretty amazing how even early. <laughs> Early CG is almost more practical than today's CG, if that makes any sense. And so it took a lot more time. It took a lot more like actual modeling and and like debris. The way that they had to have things come off had to be realistic. And it took someone actually creating that. Well, that's one of the things I've, I've come to appreciate from watching a lot of these like uh, analysis videos about CGI is how like the programs a lot of these productions are using are maybe maybe they are created by the effects company and proprietary in that way. But they have models for so many things now. Whereas back in this point in the history that you're talking about, they had to create a model for whatever they're trying to make because it hasn't been done yet. Yep. So there's the fast way and then there's the the really intensive, expensive way. And today, because so many people, I mean, there's marketplaces for this stuff, like getting into volumetric, like creating these digital environments like this. You know, you can go to a marketplace and say, I want a dresser and then look at 10,000 dressers. And these it, there's just artists out there creating these in three three dimensional models that you can purchase on the marketplace and throw into your scenes. So, yeah, I mean, and like like I said, it, I think at this time period, it wasn't really as much like that. I think maybe they had some of it. And, and one one moment that, that stands out to me that I think lines up with what you're talking about is a shot that I didn't think looked that great. And that was um, we start micro and we zoom out from this trash can. And that was a moment where everything looked for a moment kind of like uh, just like early CG. Like it was kind of obviously not a real cup and not a real piece of paper and like fairly mundane objects that usually uh, Fincher does so well, I thought just didn't look that great. And I think there was like a donut or something that just didn't look that good. Like, and that was what you're talking about. Like this, because there was no like model out there that was perfect. That could just be dropped in. It was there probably creating it for this shot. And it's just hard to do. Yeah. Um, and since we're talking about it, the, the intro to this film starts and it's this like neural network yeah. that we don't know what we're looking at as the title we're sequence is happening. Brain. And yeah, we come cool. out of the brain and we see like the sweat on the skin and the hairs were super macro on the on the skin and we move out. It's still a kind of a wild shot of like me. And, like, I still don't know exactly how they pull it off. Fincher wanted the shot so bad that they actually budgeted for the film without it. And then once they saw, once the studio saw the film, they then green light that sequence. That's how like early are we are on in CG's life cycle where they were basically like, that's so expensive. And, un and it's just a title sequence. And he was like, I need it for my film. This is what I want. It's the beginning. And I would argue it's, it's iconic. It's like, you don't know what you're looking at. And then it, he's used it for something creative that furthers the story. And I'm always for something that's furthering the story in some way. His title sequence does that. And it, and it, it makes for something really cool. Such a iconic opening to, to a movie. Okay. So the next section here, Marla overdoses on pills and telephones, the narrator for help. He ignores her and abandons the conversation without hanging up. Tyler picks up the call and goes to her apartment to save her. They begin a sexual relationship, much to the narrator's irritation. Tyler warns the narrator never to talk to Marla about him. The narrator blackmails his boss for his company's assets to support Fight Club and quits his job. 
More new members joined Fight Club, including Robert Bob Paulson, a a man with testicular cancer whom the narrator had previously met at one of his support groups. Tyler then recruits their members to a new anti-materialism, anti-corporate organization, Project Mayhem, without the narrator's involvement. The group engages in subversive acts of vandalism, increasingly troubling the narrator. After the narrator complains that Tyler has excluded him, Tyler reveals that he was the one who caused the explosion at the narrator's condo. Tyler disappears one night, and when Paulson is killed by police while fleeing from a sabotage operation, the narrator tries to halt the project. He follows a paper trail to cities Tyler had visited, discovering Project Mayhem has spread throughout the country. In one city, a project member addresses the narrator as Mr. Durden. Confused, the narrator calls Marla and discovers that she also believes he is Tyler. Tyler appears in his hotel room with a different haircut and clothing, and reveals they are dissociated personalities. The narrator assumed the personality of Tyler when he believed he was sleeping. Let's talk about that moment where Fight Club becomes Project Mayhem, because I think it actually was an added scene, and I thought it worked really well, and that was the moment of Lou coming into the basement, and Tyler taking this beating from Lou, and then tackling him and like spraying him with blood um i thought was like it's such a good scene it's very interesting right it's it's cool to see his ethos come to a like it's tested for the first time in this in this moment and everybody's watching him and they're like how is he going to respond to being challenged in this way and and real danger coming in now as a guy with a gun right and like threatening to you know potentially kill him and the way that he rolls with this and turns it to his own need, I think that's the moment where he gets all these people present to buy into the idea of Project Mayhem. And we see this immediate switch happen as he gets his like cigarette lit by a guy before he even has to ask for it. And like all this stuff, like you could see all of a sudden they are fully bought in to this guy's personality. And this is the first time where he gives a homework assignment, quote unquote, to go start a fight and lose it. And this is, to me, the creation of Project Mayhem, the beginning of the escalation of Fight Club into something else. Um, and I think this is really cleverly set up in a scene that I, I don't remember from the book. Uh, so it is there. It definitely doesn't make as much of a uh, impact on you as a reader yeah and i think that this is the logical line right most people are are like okay the the homework assignment the going and assaulting people like i kind of mentioned in the book episode like everybody's been consenting they're fighting they're sort of challenging status quos and it's helping them sort of self-actualize and then it gets to the point where now they're they're sort of disrupting culture and disrupting the world and, and they're upheaving things you know and this wasn't the line for me though the the no the, like getting starting a fight that you lose like okay it, it's like I, I don't know it's 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 pretty extreme but this wasn't the line the line come the line comes in like the next scene i just yeah in the film the way that they represent the the getting into fights yeah. is it's the the hose it's is funny. The, <laughs> the funniest thing ever uh, with this pastor or priest or whatever yeah. he is spraying him spraying, spraying the bible him. and and he keeps trying to spray people and get in fights with them and yeah. my god that that scene is so funny and i actually read that in, in the behind the scenes that the if you watch really carefully you can apparently see the camera shake because the cameraman couldn't stop laughing <laughs> And in the that. scene that they use, the take they use, it was actually like he was laughing through it. So yeah, that's pretty that's funny. so good. Which I assume is a huge no-no if you're the, if you're a camera operator. <laughs> yeah. So what was your line? Where where was it that you? So were my like, line was is what comes shortly after this, which I think is a further escalation, and that's Tyler Durden in his quote unquote human sacrifice. So he goes into this convenience store. Edward Norton's freaking out. So it's a line for him too, obviously, and he pulls the guy out with a gun you know, puts him on his knees, says you're going to die. And the whole point of this moment is that he is sort of fooling this guy into believing he's going to die and using that moment of um, being the brush with death, which, which like Tyler later calls a near life experience um, as a moment of supposed self growth 
how he says like, oh, he's going to have the best breakfast he's ever had. It's going to be the first day of the rest of his life kind of thing. He's like, I'm going to come and check up on you and make sure you're actually pursuing um, becoming a veterinarian Um, because that's what he really wants in life. And he hopes that this is going to be the kick in the pants to get him to do the thing that he always wanted to do. And, and this is where I think this crosses the line into a fantasy because I just don't believe that this would work the way that Tyler Durden is purporting it to work. I see a person who is going to be saddled with fear, PTSD, is going to struggle probably to focus, to achieve his goals because he's going to be worried. Um, I think he's going to struggle to work. I think this moment is going to have a profound influence on his life, but I do not think it's going to play out the way that Tyler Durden is purporting that it will. Um, I think it's just a little bit of like a a cherry picked idea of what it's going to be like to go through an experience like this. This this would be incredibly traumatizing to to go through. Of course, yeah. And then knowing that you're the the implication that there's this threat that somebody's watching you at all times and that somebody's going to come roll up on you. But, uh, it's this like super extreme, like wishful thinking version of like the carrot and the stick. It's like the stick is going to motivate you in some way, but like you said, it can th- these kinds of things can be damaging and debilitating and and change yeah. your outlook on things. I the think point this that- has just now. I'm not saying I know for sure how it would how it would play out, but like I think this has an equal chance of destroying this man's life as it does yeah. somehow being a catalyst for for positive change for him. Sure. Yeah, I can see that. And of course, like. At the end of the scene, we get the narrator say, you had to give it to Tyler. You know, you had to give it to him. He had a way of doing like doing things. And like I, I, I it was trying to sell me on something that I wasn't ready to buy, at least in this viewing. I was going to say, yeah, in previous viewings, I may have been yeah. like, damn, I wish somebody would do that to me. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get me motivated. Yeah, there's, it's a romantic notion. And I think the same thing comes up a little bit later when um, after the I wanted to destroy, destroy something beautiful moment, Tyler and the narrator get in the car. And this is right out of the book. Um, it's a little different because in the book, I think it's um, not Tyler driving. It's like another. It's like a another. The mechanic, mechanic is driving. Yeah, it's a very similar scene. The mechanic in this case is somebody that I recognize now in hindsight. His name's Holt McCallany, and uh, he is one of the main characters in Mindhunter, which Fincher also directed and, and executive produced. I didn't realize that that person was in this film until yeah. this viewing. Good catch. Good catch. No, because I was looking at him. I'm like, I know this guy from somewhere. I didn't. I didn't make the Mindhunter connection until you just said it. So yeah, I like that. And Fincher, I didn't. I, I was going through a lot of his IMDb films and looking at the actors. He loves to work with the same actors again. You think like Brad Pitt in Seven, Brad Pitt in this film, and then uh, you know he goes on to work with many of his actors multiple times. He's one of those one of those directors who loves to do that kind of stuff. So to get back to this car moment, so um, it's a moment where Tyler Durden is romanticizing near death experiences. He says, "I've never been in a car accident." And he orchestrates a moment of nearly dying. I think it's n- it's notable that the only reason that you're, he's able to do this is because he is sort of aware of the plot armor he has in a meta way. Like, they're the main characters of this story. They're not going to die here. And I, I, I just... To me, like life is so much more random and unfair that, again, there is such a strong chance that someone just dies doing something like this and the story's over. Like, what if the movie ended, (laughs) you know, after this scene? Because they just both die in this car accident. Um, But, you know, they're not going to. And so there's an artificiality to this supposed... um, huge like a sort of self-actualizing moment of near life experience as he calls it that just it okay I, I think part of it is also that like in real life I have nearly died in a car accident and so to see it romanticized in this way was a little frustrating now I, I had a moment where I was trying to think like how did it change my life after watching this right like how how did nearly dying in a car accident change me as a person because it did Right. Like it's it's going to but it it didn't do it in this romantic notion. Now, did I gain some sort of insight that has been, you know, an asset to me going forward? Maybe it's hard to put to quantify that. 
Um, yeah. But the price is so, so steep. That's what I was going to say. It's like, ultimately, how could you think that it was worth, right. you know? Is it is it like someone seeking that? Is that is that seeking it for the right reason? And so again, it's like this is a fantasy that I'm watching, and um, the reality is just not is just not what what is being presented here. And and I know that like it's like I'm almost taking it too literally, and like I think a lot of people would look at this and say like, um, you know, it's more of a metaphor. You know, like stop taking it so literally, but. But I, I I think that that's one of the things that is lacking when this movie is propped up as like a way of life and it's hero worshipped in a way and like this ideology um, is is held up as being something that is actually something people should live by and that's where I feel like it's open to this sort of criticism as just a fun movie with a you know an, an interesting thing to have happen sure like it works in that sense. I was just going over my notes and I found a couple of things that I wanted to address with uh, Chuck Palahniuk's sort of viewpoint on the film. Okay, yeah. He revealed that when he wrote the book, he didn't know that Tyler and the narrator were the same person until he was two thirds of the way through writing the story. I've heard that too. Um, which is very interesting to think about. Yeah. And the way that he, it's the way that the story is structured and the film at that, uh, you know, for that much as well. They they started. I think he said they started to act like the same person, so that he chose to finish the story in yeah. that way. Now that they become the same person, as, as someone who has written a book and is writing a book now, like just because you don't know two thirds of the way through doesn't mean that you're not going back once you have figured that out and making sure that that is present sure. throughout. Which I think he had to have done for the book itself. Too much of it lines up. He also revealed that uh, some of the specific content in the in the novel, such as splicing fra- single frames of pornography into family films, uh, attending support groups for terminally ill, erasing videotapes, came from stories told to him by friends and from things his friends actually did. Yeah, I mean, I totally buy it. This is like that we talked about how he's a part of this, uh, you know, uh, chaos sort of uh, organization, and uh, th- that's kind of what. Project Mayhem was based off of um, and how he did do the support groups and like a lot of this stuff I, I totally buy um, I, I've even heard now I don't know if this is apocryphal or not but I've heard people say that Palinuk has said that the adaptation is the superior version of the story that he thinks the movie is better than his book I did read something about that I, heard, I read that he said that he found it to be an improvement on his novel I don't know that he said it's one's better than the other but he said improvement so improvement that means on, I guess usually better it, that yeah. seems to say that and like I, I, yeah, I hadn't like heard him say that directly, but I've heard it reported that he has has said that, which is notable because so often, right? Like authors aren't going to say that; <laughs> they're usually going to stand by the source material as being the best. Sure, I think it's I think it's a humble thing to, to say too, though, right? Like if you if you approach it in that way, like you, your book, the book it will always stand as what it is, and I think that people like you and I are going to always give the credit where credit's due for someone to craft the story in this yeah. way. The ideas are his, so it's a, it, it, an improvement on. I like that term because it acknowledges that you're taking an existing thing and improving it, and the existing thing is still the thing he made. Um, I wanted to ask you just as we were talking about the movie making of it all, how do you feel? Like, how did you, how, I, don't, I don't know a lot about like the behind the scenes projectionist stuff, but like I always thought it was so cool how the changeover happens and the pointing out the little dot that pops up there, which I feel like is a very old school movie thing. Now you don't see a lot anymore. But maybe, well, there's no film reels anymore. Maybe like in, if you're actually watching film reels in a theater, yeah. that was a thing. If you're seeing yeah, yeah actual film projected. Is that all like totally track for you? I love it. So so a little insight. I, I started working at movie theaters as the transition from film to digital happened. So uh, many people that I knew were projectionists. And I got to like sort of get trained on projection right as it was ending. But it wasn't this kind of projection. This is more intense that... Like the, I would say like the, you know, mid to late 2000s was a lot different than the the late 90s just because technology had advanced. Um, it's it is it's an intense job. And and the way that it's portrayed is is really interesting because he's just like this tinkerer up there and he's in his lab and he's creating all this this stuff as a mad scientist. Um I, I think it's it, I, I love seeing the history of film being talked about in this way. Did I did read and I had never heard of it referred to this this way, but the cigarette burns 
Uh, it's never been called that. He he made that up. Palinek made that up. Okay, I was that was one I wanted to ask you about. The, that term. There are actually the the notices like you're getting close to the end of the reel. Okay, but that term cigarette burns, I guess he he invented. And there's like a person up there watching for that notice so they can know to switch the reel over. Yeah, and again, I think it's some. It's a, it depends on on what it is, but like I remember when Avatar, like James Cameron's Avatar came out. And they had like if you had a plate that had the entire roll for Avatar, I think it was the IMAX roll. It was like hundreds of pounds of film that had been like processed and it's all reeled together and they put it on this plate and it plays through. And that's the thing, right? You're, you're either if you if you're running it through a smaller reel, you do have to switch that over. But I think changes in technology. And again, I'm not an expert on this, but I know that like eventually they got to the point where they didn't have to like actively swap it as much. But you did have to have someone constantly monitoring because those things would melt. There's a lot of heat and and film does burn and melt pretty easily. So why would they melt just randomly or, or a hot bulb yeah. near something that's flammable? Yeah, because I feel like I do have a memory when it's like a teenager being in a theater and seeing actual film melt. Like on, Yeah, I'm like sure it, you like have. It yeah. happened one time and they and they had to change yeah, it. it happened often and and they would splice they would have to splice it back together yeah. and you know all kinds of things would happen a lot of times when that would happen they would just refund everybody's money and you'd have to come see it another time yeah um and then the other thing is that often they would break like your your film it'll snap yeah be based on the pulley system sort of mm-hmm. you know going wrong and pulling and breaking in one but and i assume through. this is all being simulated in the thing we're watching now right we're watching on a blu-ray so like i thought it was an interesting moment where there's this zoom in on tyler durden he's delivering one of his iconic lines and like the reel actually lifts up a little bit and shakes it looked like you could see the edges of the film well, they shot this in on film, so yeah. they could have done that practically, but yeah. there were a lot of different film techniques that were used to, like, doctor this. Like, from what I understand, they did something to, like, give it a dirty patina. They were, like, processing it in certain ways, and they were doing this silver, silvering effect, I believe, where they were sort of underexposing in ways, and, and they were changing things so that uh, they were playing with the, the actual physical you know, piece of film and, and, del- and in delivering the final product, they wanted it to lurk, look sort of, sort of grungy and dirty. And, and, you know, that, I think that's really fun as well to, to actually take what you shot and degrade it in some way is a brave and bold thing. And, you know, the coloring that they chose. And if you notice anything that's shot during the day, apparently is mostly in the shade in some way. So they kind of really wanted to lean into like a lot of night scenes and darkness and the way that they lit characters. Interestingly, towards the end of the movie, I remember there's more day, like as he's traveling around chasing after Mm -hmm. Tyler, he's going like during the day to a lot of these bars. And you'll notice even when characters are lit during the day, the way that they're lit often, you can't see their eye as well as you might normally and that has to do with like wanting to create some sort of darkness or not being able to see the eyes directly is like you know that's something that feels unnatural or like you don't know somebody or maybe they're shrouded in darkness or something but and to me like and I don't know if this is fair maybe it's just one small aspect of directing but like that's always a hallmark to me of a of like a, a really a, you know accomplished director is lining up choices like that thematically with the story being told and finding ways to make it all resonate. Uh, totally. You know, I, I think that's, that's, that's one of the things that holds up so well in this movie. And that's the kind of detail oriented stuff I'm talking about. Like you have to, he has to think about what's going on, especially in a film like this where some, so much is layered, like what's going on in the background. What does the sign in the background say? How does that color affect what's happening in this part of the frame and comp like, like if you're a director, DP, a director of photography, if you're both cinematographer, um, that is so much responsibility, so many choices on your plate all at the same time, because there's constantly people from all departments coming and asking you and they're asking you thematic things. Does this person wear yellow or red? And the, you have to think about the character and how it either contrasts with the other characters or complements them. And and just all of those little details in the way that you're lighting. And, and ultimately, like a director works very closely with their gaffer who's in charge of lighting and their director of photography who's in charge of what everything looks like in frame. Um, and realistically every other department as well but but to get that image on screen and to make those choices you know those are choices you make in pre-production and that's why it's so important to just like so much work goes into these before a single you know frame of film and to me it's like just knowing all the little little places that artistic choices can be made and not taking anything for granted and saying like we'll just go standard 
we'll just go standard on all these. Other. It's like, no, 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 no. Every one of these little things is a little knob that can be tweaked. There's a little choice that can be made to, for some reason, push it in a direction that lines up with the vision of the movie you want to make. And, and a really good director should be thinking about that at every step of the process. It's a privilege to get to direct something. So why would you why would you not put that much thought and effort into every frame? Right. Like so not everybody gets the chance to do it. And there are people out there who do that. They're like, let's just make the day and let's just get out of here. And, you know, if it's exposed correctly and we get them in frame, we got the shot. And there's so much more to film than that. And so like that's to, that's sort of a disservice to, to the the medium of film. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that like I want to champion going forward. And, and I think we have championed on this podcast is like the movies that do that. And so even if not everything lines up, even if we don't agree with everything, even if every message isn't, you know, something that personally resonates with us, I always want to give it up for great filmmaking. And I think that's on display here. I think this movie is incredibly well made. This uh, makes me want to talk about the the way that he decided to shoot this film as well. And, and there are times that Fincher is very deliberate about when he does his lock off shots and when he does something with motion. But in this film, it's so kinetic. There's so many like whip pans from one character to the other side of the room. And just like the characters are being sort of like orbited by the camera at times. And whip the, pan and, and transitions it, where like it like switches into another scene entirely like that stuff is really cool. Yeah, it feels very 90s too, but I love it. Like it's <laughs> it's awesome. And uh it's that kind of kinetic filmmaking that again, choices are being made like what how do we get out of the scene and like how do we plan this? Matching scene transitions, those kinds of things are they, it means a lot to the audience whether they realize it or not. It, it's hugely like visually impactful. Um and you know, that gets back to some of the CG stuff like talking about things that you can't you couldn't have seen and there's the shot we talked about before of the of his entire apartment blowing up and we travel around and like go up to the stove and move back out and follow down the back of the the refrigerator all the way down to the the light or whatever the condenser that's down there and like the way that he's designing these shots to move through space is still within the language of cinema and the way that he's moving the camera is furthering the story again and and just the way that he's using cg to do that whereas sometimes people are just locking down the camera using cg to just like paint something out or something like that that's not to say there's anything against that it's just that like especially in 99 for how expensive this technology was and how expensive it was to get artists to do these things he's he's so dead set on having some of these shots and it really fits with the the the, the style and the tone of the film All right, I'm going to read the last section here. The narrator blacks out. When he returns to the house, he uncovers Tyler's plans to erase debt by destroying buildings that contain credit card records. He apologizes to Marla and warns her that she is in danger, but she is tired of his contradictory behavior and refuses to listen. He tries to warn the police, but the officers turn out to be part of the project. Tyler had told them not to let his soft alter ego interfere with the plans, and the officers threaten to castrate him if he calls it off. He escapes and tries to disarm the explosive in one building, but Tyler subdues him. With Tyler holding him at gunpoint on the floor, the narrator realizes that as he and Tyler are the same person, the narrator is holding the gun. He fires it into his own mouth, shooting through his cheek. Tyler stands motionless as smoke coils out of his mouth. An exit wound materializes at the back of his head before he collapses and vanishes. Marla arrives and finds the narrator badly wounded but alive. He tells her that she met him at a very strange time in his life, and they both hold hands and watch as the buildings around them explode. Props for this movie going there and having the thing happen and leaving it to the viewer to be like, well, shit, well, what happens now? Now, obviously, this this idea is such a like specific moment in time where we would buy that if you just blow up certain buildings that debt records would be erased. There's no fucking way in hell that happens now. <laughs> like, like there's it's you know there's too many redundancies and just so many things. Yeah, there's so many there's so much in this film in general that that is so of the time. Yeah. And you're not gonna make that like as a as Americans we weren't making buildings being blown up sort of. Yeah, yeah. This this was this was what two years before 9/11 was gonna happen. So it's this snapshot of like, and it's talking about like, we don't have a war to fight and we don't have this and that. And like, all I had the things that line that... marked down too. It says our, our generation has no great war, has no great depression. Our great yeah. depression is our lives. And it is this weird middle period where like 90 specifically, just like how quickly society and, and just young men in society started feeling like there was no purpose and because of that. Yeah. And then ultimately like in seeing now, nowadays we look back and like clearly 
it, it shouldn't be a purpose for people to go to war anyway. You know, it was funny how I had this response when I heard that line of I was just like, just wait. <laughs> right. You know, the war on terror, you know, maybe it's not a great world war in the sense that he's referencing, but like it would shape politics for, you know. Well, in our society, the way that we as adults act. And it is a massive war that happened and continued to happen. And it's kind of the never ending war that we find ourselves in now. Um, and yeah, you, and then and then you also have plenty of like economic depressions and rec- and recessions that have happened since then. So to say boldly, we have no Great Depression, I was like, oh, man, that just wait. Well, and to be kind of wishing for it, right? <laughs> yeah. Because they, they want something to motivate them in the same kind of way that Tyler motivates this person with fear almost. like. Uh, on top of all of that, he also, his goal is to erase debt and yeah. create an equality of wealth. He's redistributing wealth. Yeah. Like think about how like communist and socialist and and um lefty a lot of these ideas are. And it's so funny to me how a lot, so many people on the far right have latched onto this movie. And you know, there's like in I was reading that like it, it became the like the film for incels. Um it, you know, and like it, it's so bizarre to me to still have all this like leftist ideology that is also in here and somehow just gets ignored. <laughs> just right. cherry picked. It's like it's cherry tons of entertainment. Exactly. Like think about the people who are like super into like uh V from V for Vendetta and yeah. like some of these other things, like what these people stand for at times and Watchmen, and then, like, just any Alan Moore. Watchmen, <laughs> like, sure, yeah. yeah. You know. Uh the guy's an anarchist and and uh you know you have people who love unironically love the MCU and prop it up as like the greatest thing in the world and then also love Watchmen and also love Alan Moore even though Alan Moore fucking hates the MCU and he hates like modern superhero movies because it is antithetical to what he was trying to say when he made Watchmen and how like like I'm not saying it's impossible to like both things but you should also recognize how they are at odds with each other they are not one and the same Definitely. No, I mean, if you see if you see Watchmen as a superhero movie you, you, or, or, you know, comic, you miss you miss the mark. You miss the point of it. Yeah, exactly. So there's the line that's extremely shocking in this film where uh, Marla says, I haven't been fucked like that since I was in grade school. Right. Yeah. And that was that an ad lib? I think I remember some story about this or something. So, yeah, there is there is a story to it. Basically, originally she was going to say, I want to have your abortion, which I think might even be in the book. It might have been, yeah, yeah. I think it, it might was, I think it was. So th- apparently, Fox objected to it greatly, and they said you got to change the line. And um, Laura Ziskin was the president of production at the time, um, and basically, David Fincher said he would change it if the new line couldn't be cut, and she agreed to it. <laughs> and Fincher wrote the replacement line. <laughs> the new line couldn't with... be cut. All right, it's so funny that someone had agreed to that. <laughs> And then she said, can you please put back the original line of abortion? And he said, no, we're going to stick with this one now. I, it's that idea of like the antagonist, like auteur director yeah. having to having to have it his way. But, I'm, you know, I, who knows? I, I'm not going to yeah. say it didn't happen. Yeah, that's that's a pretty wild story. Um, I, one mo- a moment that I wanted to touch on was uh, when we get back to the original opening shot and... Uh, Edward Norton says, I I still can't talk with a gun in my mouth. And then, and then Tyler Durden says, ah, flashback humor. And no, he said, he says, I still can't think of anything or something. I still can't think of anything. And then, and then Tyler says, ah, flashback humor. And uh, that is such a meta moment. It shows that Tyler Durden exists outside the story in a way. Like he, he is larger than the film itself. Um, It kind of, it's such a clever moment and it gives so much power to the character. And, um, it's so fun. It's something I hadn't seen before. Um, you know, it's powerful stuff. And, and I, I, you know, just props to, to Fincher for finding moments to do that. And, and I think that's, that is in some ways how I think this movie could be an, an improvement on the story. Incredibly clever. Like just you know, those moments that like, I think I could never have written. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's so funny and so sharp. And it's so fitting for the story. Uh, I just love it. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that one. So we're talking about this narrator character a lot, right? And I talked last week about how people are driven mad by not knowing things in films and in stories in general. Much the confusion of fans, we never learn his name, right? Many believe that the name is Jack because the phrase, I am Jack's blank, 
is used so often and then others disagree and they argue that jack he just uses jack because that's what he saw an annotated reader or whatever right um but in the press packages released for the movie um which came in the form of an ikea s catalog the character is referred to as jack as he is on the back of the dvd and in the booklet accompanying the dvd um where the chapter list is referred to as jack's chapters also the original screenplay refers to him as jack um and then on the other hand, the captions for the film at times refer to him as Rupert, which was one of the name tags yeah, he had. used a few different um, names, yeah. And then Edward Norton reveals that he refers to the character as Jack in the audio commentary yeah. for the film. Well, I know the truth. Tell it to me. He doesn't have a name. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. Like, he, like it, I don't get why people think there is a truth to this, that there is a name to be found. He doesn't have a name in the book. He doesn't have a name in the story. And any name that you're trying to find is like, ha ha, I found his actual name. Like, yeah. There is no truth it's, to this. It's like anything with ambiguity, yeah. though, right? Like any film that ends in ambiguity, there's yeah. no truth to how it actually ends. Who, you decide, who gets to right? decide what, what this character's name is? I would argue Chuck Palahniuk, I guess, if you're looking for any actual truth. And he didn't give him a name in the book. So he has no name. I'm sorry to tell you that is just the way it is. <laughs> Unless it gets revealed in Fight Club Two or Fight Club Three, which apparently there are, are actual you know comics that that maybe have has additional information, I don't know. Well, that's and you can also think like there's two alternate versions of the story here, right? Like so, the novel version has no name, and maybe the film version. Some people feel it feels to me like super deep dive m- trivia. It's 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 a fan thing because fans want to do this too, where they're like, "What do you think actually happened?" When they watch some movie and you're like, there is no, tr- there's no, there is no objective truth. It's fictional. The point <laughs> is that we don't know. That's the entire point of the end of the film. Well, yeah, all there, all there draw is. Draw your own conclusion. All there is, is the story you were told. There is no objective truth underneath it to be found. And like, I, I get that that can be frustrating for people because that's not the way they engage with storytelling. Like they want to view a film as existing in some sort of truth. But it's just an illusion. Like it's all a magic trick. It's all crafted, and I, I, it, it the fascination with it I find like amusing. I guess ultimately because I, I just know that like I know how it feels to like write stuff like this and just be like l- laughing at the idea that there is a truth there that like maybe even the author isn't aware of. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's the kind of thing that I feel like I engaged more when I was first really starting to get into storytelling, and now it feels a little exhausting to me just because there is never going to be an answer, and it it realistically is more int- It's always going to be endlessly more interesting that he has no name than if we call him Jack. Yeah, because he's the no name protagonist, right? That falls in line with so like a literary tradition ultimately, because that's supposed to be a self insert, and I think that's the, that's the decision it was made that way like i talked about last week too it fits the story right like he does he gets a name the characters in this thing get a name when they die and he has no name and there's clearly in my opinion something being set up there as well he doesn't have a name what does that mean about him in society and and like how he's viewed yeah okay so let's let's fast forward through the end here um so we get the narrator becoming this like damaged sponge of a character right like he's thrown down on two flights of stairs he's shot through the mouth and there's even characters like saying like i don't know how the fuck that guy's still standing um it, it reminds me of like uh, of, uh, of uh of of die hard which is ironic uh considering what we're about to announce at the end of this episode stay tuned um but it reminds me like i i am kind of attracted to that because one thing that is true in real life is that the human body's weird and yeah, like you can at the same time that you can get uh, an infection and a cut on your hand and it kills you, there can also be people who have had insane injuries and yet still walk around and talk to people while like after it's happened. Like the the body is so fucking weird and hard to predict how it's going to react to things. Um that even though it completely pushes believability to have a character still be able to walk around and talk can I definitively say it's impossible? No. Like, yeah, if you got thrown down two flights of ste- stairs like he does in this, like, you probably die. You probably just die because that's incredibly traumatic to the body. But is there a chance you don't? Is there a chance you're still able to function? Sure. Like, because wild shit happens. So, I don't know. The, it, part of me does still kind of like the idea of him just being unrealistically 
able to just weather the damage he takes at the end. I don't know. It's something kind of fun about that. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, and then the of course the movie ends uh, with the scene with all these buildings falling down, and like that's another moment where I was thinking about like what we know now after nine eleven of like it doesn't matter that these buildings don't have people in them. If you have eight fucking buildings collapse downtown, they're going to take out other buildings. They're going to create a dust cloud. The the you know there's going to be so many things that are going to harm so many people from this that it doesn't matter that they're em- that they're empty quote unquote when it happens doesn't matter. <laughs> so many people are going to suffer and die because of this. Um, that that all falls. You know. I also notice like the explosions actually happening and the buildings falling. Like they sort of get like a slight shockwave and they're like kind of stumble a little bit. But like I refuse to believe they wouldn't be like thrown on their asses and like <laughs> you know. I, be... I don't know. I mean they're inside of a you know they're they're inside of a building so maybe it guards them somewhat but maybe yeah i, I, I feel know, like man. it'd be like earthquakes a bunch of buildings falling at the same time yeah. would have to be like earthquakes to, i don't know talk about a great shot uh the moment he puts the gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger and the way we see the muzzle flare inside of his cheeks and the like the um rippling of the flesh and like all of that i think it looks fucking good like even today like i, I was like damn i can't believe they how they pulled that off and the model they must have had of edward norton's face to be able to get it to look right it's really good. It probably helps that he was so fucked up in this moment and he had like two hugely swollen eyes and like all this stuff to where like the uncanny valley gets dodged a little bit because he already looks so unusual. <laughs> that probably helped. Um, and then, yeah, you met me at a very strange time in my life. I think it's a funny way to, to end this thing. Um, and the movie itself reminds you not to take it too seriously. You get a flash of a dick right at the end. Um, and then I do think there's a little bit of like a meta 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 commentary as I'm looking at this movie and and like how much of it is engaging with what it means to be a man and masculinity and to be shown a dick in frame when we first introduced Tyler Durden and to be shown a dick again at the end bookending the story of Tyler Durden and how he is this like manifestation of toxic masculinity um I don't know I don't know if that was done on purpose yet it is so fitting to me that that is the case I don't know. I always just took it as like a joke at the end, but like there is almost a meta meaning for having that happen. Is it specifically a dick, right? Like it's a man. <laughs> I don't I don't know. It's funny. We just had a conversation about how like, you know, artists are always intentional with the things that they do. And then like things like this do happen yeah, where sometimes it's, like, it's accidental, maybe... but it could still work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Interesting movie, man. Um, I was thinking about how I was having a conversation with my wife about it. And she had not seen this movie before we started dating. And early on in us dating, we watched it together. Because I was like, oh, yeah, it's a great movie. We should watch it. And um, she didn't like it. And she was just like, it's just toxic masculinity, the movie. And I was like, that's true. (laughs) Like, that is is what this movie is. And there's not a lot here for women to appreciate unless you just, you know, want to watch a movie for Brad Pitt's abs, which, like, okay, I get that. But, like, there's not a lot here because it doesn't engage with women at all. Like, Marla is not really a great woman character <laughs> she is she's kind of like the manic pixie dream kind of thing yeah, yeah she is exactly and and the manic pixie dream disaster let's call her that <laughs> um but uh yeah it, it it's such a weird movie but yet i can't deny the influence it's had on me in my life and that's what i, I guess i just want to come back to when i'm talking about this thing um it, it's such an important movie for me and it has been um, and, and I will continue, I think, to think about the ideas proposed here and by Palinuk's writing, and it will continue to be something that I interrogate throughout my life because they're so striking. And like Tyler Durden talking to me and saying, like, don't get caught up in the bullshit of consumerism, um, which, of course, like he didn't invent that. This is probably some like 2000 year old monk who was first talking about how consumerism is bullshit. And he's touching on a lot of the same ideas. Um but it's it's just so powerful um, that it's it's still an interesting thing to talk about, even as I disagree with a lot. And I think maybe I was a little more critical on our previous episode. So if you want to hear, like, if you didn't listen to that one, listen to that as I sort of interrogate a lot of these ideas, I think, a little more I- intensively than I did here. Yeah. I mean, with you saying how much you love the film, too, like, we're now at a period where we have to decide which we prefer. So this will be an interesting one for you to pick. Right. And and I think I'm at the same place that Palinuk's at with this, because I give him so much credit for creating it. I do think he didn't... I don't think he really knew what he was making at the time. He, You know, this was his debut. I think he was just being transgressive and engaging with questions he had about life and a dissatisfaction. 
I, you know, he couldn't have known the life that this thing would go on to have and the, the audience that it would go on to engage with and that he would basically create the term snowflake, which would become such a hot button term in our politics. And like, he didn't know that that was going to happen. Um, but I got to give him so much credit for creating it. Yet I still feel like this adaptation is like the perfect it's like a perfect adaptation in so many ways in the sense that it took the source material and improved upon it and made it really, really land and gave us standout performances and became a, a, a piece of cinema history in a way. Um, and, and you have this great director come in and it's like everything you want as an artist, I think. Um, so ultimately I'm going to give it to the adaptation as much as respect as I have for that source material. I do think it was an improvement. Yeah. I'm going to agree with you in this case. You, you said basically everything I would say credit where credit's due. Chuck Palahniuk wrote this incredible piece that, that allowed me to think differently, even though I, you know, I came to it later. I read it recently for the first time, but the fact that he, he created all these things that would go on to create this film. And in, in some me. ways you have read the novel because you've seen this movie, <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Like it, it's such a faithful adaptation in that way. Right. You can't separate one from the other. It feels at this point. Um, it, it, I just think it's, it was, it hit me at a perfect time. Like we talked about being a teenager and how this spoke to me and like the, the level of uncertainty that I had and the ways that I felt like I didn't have control and I was like feeling the same kind of wants and needs to lash out. Um, it just spoke to me on those levels then and now I still am able to analyze it as a piece that's, it, it, it holds a really special place because of the time period it came out to a time where I was starting to really dig into film and understand more about film. So it means a lot to me too. I, I think that it's, you know, there are some things that now in today's modern sensibilities, I, I'm, I kind of look at it and, and there are things that seem like kind of quaint in, in hindsight, but uh, you know, overall it's a, it's a strong performance and, and just like a expert vision, like Fincher coming in to, to deliver something like that is never going to, I mean this, again, this makes a filmmaker, you, you have a couple, you have seven, that's a, that's a, you know, career maker right there, but then you follow it up with something like uh, fight club and it becomes part of the zeitgeist. It is like one of the most recognizable films of the last hundred years, like super quotable. It's, it's iconic. Yeah. I mean, if Twitter had been around when this movie first came out, I'd have been tweeting fucking quotes from it constantly. And I'd been, ins I'd have been insufferable. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're going to give it to the movie. Uh, one last thing I want to say is, and I don't know if you saw this story at all, but I just have to mention it since we're covering fight club. I always remember a story about, Edward Norton and Brad Pitt supposedly going to like a premiere of this film and getting super high and having, and like apparently everybody hated it. And they were like, I don't, I can't remember. Were they heckling? I can't remember what was going on, but they were just super high at a premiere for this movie in which everybody hated and how, like just the, how funny an idea that is to me of Edward Norton and Brad Pitt being in the audience. Apparently nobody knew they were there. And so they were just observing it. <laughs> um, what a weird, what a weird thing. What a weird movie. I didn't read that or anything. You didn't yeah, read that? All. Yeah, I can't remember. It was like an Edward Norton story or something I heard one time. And um, it's so funny. Um, there's so many stories around this movie. Listening to the uh, listening to the commentary tracks will get you so many of these funnest little stories in the background. All right. So if you want to hear what our Christmas project is going to be this year, uh, stick around to the very end. Oh, also shout out to our patrons for voting for this as a quarterly project. We forgot to say that at the start of this one, but um, this was a community selection. Great one. Thanks for doing it. We thank you for your support. If you wanted to support us, check us out on patreon.com slash ink to film. We are also releasing uh, a bonus episode where we talk about the three episodes of Cur Cabinet of Curiosities that we didn't cover on the main feed. And there are some really interesting ones in there that we had a lot of fun talking about. Um, that is out right now over on Patreon. So check it out and you can listen to that. And be sure to connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter while it's still around. We're also on TikTok and basically other social media platforms. So find us out there. Yeah, at Ink to Film on all of those. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, also uh, a great way to let us know that's free is to let us know in the form of a rating and review on whatever app you chose to listen on. Give us five stars. Give us a little comment about enjoying our Fight Club coverage. We'd love to see that. And thank you to Ocrix for the use of our intro and outro music. All right, let's announce our Christmas project. The last thing to do here, 
Um, we have previously covered Die Hard way back in season one, I think, of, of, of Ink to Film. So it's time to return to John McClane. I teased it already. We are going to be covering Die Hard 2 this year for the holidays, uh, in, which was based off of a novel called 58 Minutes by Walter Wager. Um, I have never read this novel. I know nothing about it. And I'm really curious to see what it's like um, and, and uh, compare it to, you know, Nothing Lasts Forever by Roderick Thorpe that we covered way back in the day. Um, and, you know, it should be fun. We have already tackled Is Die Hard a, a Christmas Movie, which has kind of been like th- a topic. I think everyone's kind of accepted that it, it, that it done is. Done to now. death at this point. Right. But but I think it, it was 2017, yeah. so it was a different time. Now we're going to figure out if Die Hard 2 is a Christmas movie. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I, my memory of it is that it occurs and during the holidays in, in an airport. That's about it. So I'll be curious to revisit and see uh, how much of a Christmas movie we feel like it is. Uh, excited to get back to John McClane and Die Hard. And until next time, keep adapting. <laughs>